Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Our guest today is Jerry Marzinski, a past guest, a person who spent a lot of time in the mental health field in mental health institutions, in fact, the largest one in the world at one time, as well as in the prison correction system in Arizona, where Jerry Marzinski worked with a lot of uh, psychiatric patients, but within the context of the prison system. So without any further ado, Jerry Marzinski, welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Well, it's, it's good to be back again, James. Uh, yeah, I've, as I spoke to you earlier, I have a, a series of um, actual patients I've worked with and some very interesting cases here that kind of point out what it's like for them to live with these voices that they're hearing which in previous shows we talked about uh, how, how we found that these things were not hallucinations as psychiatry says. And uh, kind of to briefly go back and pick up a little bit from back there, uh, while at the state hospital, uh, after seven years, I saw that these voices ran patterns. And they were not random like hallucinations. They were consistently negative, derogatory, and nasty. And the pattern was always apparently to upset the patient as much as possible. Um, you know, I, I, I was told that uh, by psychiatry and by, you know, graduate school that these voices were caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain of the patient. And I believed that. You know, I, I, you know, I never had any reason to doubt that until I saw that psychiatry was not giving any labs. They were giving no tests whatsoever to measure any kind of chemical brain imbalance in the brain of any of these patients to see what, if anything, was in balance. And, and you, you kind of go, okay, you know, how do they know what's out of balance if they don't have any kind of test to, to show that? And they did not have any kind of test to show that. Matter of fact, they didn't have any evidence to any any substantial evidence to prove that what they uh, what was happening with uh, schizophrenics was a brain imbalance. You know, you can't see it on MRIs. You can't see it in blood work. You, you know, they 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 can't detect it other than but by the behavior they're seeing out of these out of these patients. So it was kind of like, okay, if it's not caused by a chemical imbalance, what does cause this? And after asking all the staff, you know, th th you know, they weren't curious. I mean, I was like, you know, okay, if these guys are hearing voices, why doesn't anybody want to know what the voices are saying? And, you know, you ask them, well, well they're all delusions, they're hallucinations, you know, they, they don't make any sense. But nobody was asking. And so I'm like, I wanted to know what the voices were saying because it appeared that, well, it was clear that when the voices were telling these people to kill themselves, which happens often, the psychiatrist would jump up like stuck pigs and, and put these guys on suicide watch, fill them full of drugs. I mean, those voices were very real at that point. You know, and they reacted to them as if they were a real threat, and they would drug these people up and lock them up and and uh, keep them medicated until they kind of got over wanting to kill themselves. Um, but in all other cases, they ignored what the voices were saying. So it's like, okay, what what are these things? And you know, they were consistently negative. Um, so to get at that, one of the biggest problems that I faced at the beginning, and it took kind of a, a few years to kind of figure out how to get over this, what we're dealing with here, and, and all this information I'm about to give today uh, pertains only to paranoid schizophrenics. There's a lot of different types of schizophrenics. Paranoid schizophrenia is one of the biggest ones. It's one of the ones of most concern. It's one of the ones that results in the most violence, um, uh, and it's one of the most prevalent ones all over the world. Um, I have statistics somewhere, but in the United States, it's like you know, 10 million people it affects and their families, which multiplies that out, you know, tremendously. Um, so what these guys experience 
when they first encounter these voices. Now, what's, what's important to understand is that these voices sound just like their own thoughts. I mean, they don't come through like, oh, yeah, 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 like the Boogie Wiggy Man. They, they sound just like their own thoughts. Uh, they, they hit people mostly who have been physically, sexually, and, and uh, emotionally severely abused. So they're already depressed. They're already have a negative mindset. They're already transmitting negativity from the traumas that they've faced. And, and the voices are, they're like sharks that smell blood. You know, when they, when they detect a big pool of negative emotional energy, you know, they're there to kind of fire it off the best they can. So uh, it, people get hit with these most often around 25 years of age. So the individual might be trucking around um, and you know, going on with their lives and they stub their toe. And all of a sudden, a thought comes into their head that says, well, you stupid bastard. You couldn't even see that thing. You stubbed your toe, you know. Uh, and and it's, it sounds just like their own thought. And then later on, they might have lost something, you know. And it's like, then that thought comes in, well, you know, you're, you're stupid and you're worthless. And, and, and it picks up from there. But it, it sounds like them talking to themselves. Um, and then it grows in intensity. Now, sometimes they come on and they say, hey, we can help you out. There was one girl that uh, she started hearing and they said, well, we can help you out on your exams. She was in college. And they told her all the answers to the exams. So she goes, hey, this is cool. So she thought they were friends until they slowly started turning negative on her. And I got called when uh, her mother saw that she was considering suicide and uh, the voices were telling him to kill herself. So the, the voices can come on fast, they can come on slow. Amphetamine is one of the biggest things that brings them about. I mean, amphetamines just opens you up to infestation by these things like nothing else. I've seen more people go uh, psychotic on amphetamines than any other drug. Uh, on the other hand, they don't like marijuana because it calms you down and you don't have a nasty withdrawal from it. They want drugs that feel good at first and then have a nasty, ugly withdrawal. And they will steer you toward those drugs and steer you away from marijuana. You know, I don't know how many times I talked to patients who said the voices didn't want them using marijuana. And I found that interesting. So as these voices increase in intensity, they start increasingly berating the pe person. And, and there was one patient I talked to where the voices came in and it was like they were trying to drive a new car. Uh, they would say, hey, go over there and pick up that pencil, you know, or, you know, turn around uh, and walk through that door. Or and it's kind of like they were trying to see how much the person would listen to what they had to say, how much control they had. It was like they were tr experimenting with a new vehicle or something, which I found uh, interesting. Um, now that the rub comes is, is trying to, the, for the patient to figure out where, where these thoughts are coming from, if they're their own thoughts, uh, and why this is happening. So uh, it, as the voices in, begin increasing their control and tell them more horrible things about themselves, uh, I mean, and it's always consistently negative. I mean, you would think hallucinations would be all over the place. They'd be positive, negative, neutral, everything in between. These are not. These run well-defined patterns, and they're repetitive patterns or predictable patterns. They are not random. The conversations that these people carry on with these voices are not word salad. It's not a bunch of you could have do the Bob Govely goop. These are complete sentences that they speak to them in. That's uh, not broken. Uh, it's like they're speaking to an invisible entity in their in their heads, in their minds. Uh, at first, they don't know what's going on. They're very confused. They're very frightened. Um, they they don't know which thoughts are theirs and which thoughts are these this coming in from this the, the voices uh, other than the voices are telling them vile things that they don't want to share with others um, 
they <clears throat> they cause constant nightmares and attack these people three, four in the morning. They do not want them to sleep, and that's part of weakening them to so they they will not resist their suggestions. Um, so as these things increase, you know, these people need somebody to speak to. So they think, okay, I'll I'll speak to my friends, and they tell their friends about these strange voices that they're hearing and some of the nasty things they're saying and their friends kind of back off and go, Ooh, you're, you know, you're weird or, you know, something's odd about you. This isn't right. And, uh, and, and slowly they, they back off, think they're weird, think they're possessed. And that's the first blow they get with regard to trying to tell somebody about the voices and it's it's a fairly negative experiences and then the voices come in and go see we told you that if you told anyone about us that this would happen you know and it's like it verifies what the voices told them in the first place so they've learned not to talk about the voices there is no positive benefit for them to talk to anyone about the voices because it's caused them nothing but trouble and heartache and nobody believes them anyway All right. so they keep the voices to themselves they isolate themselves because it's easier not to deal with people and try to figure out what's the voices what's not the voices and the voices are always telling them negative things about their friends their family any close relationship they have because they want to break them away from those relationships and isolate them and the patient feels uh, more secure when they're isolated because then you know, they only have to deal with the voices and they don't have to deal with trying to figure out what's the voices and what's somebody else talking to them or uh, whether something that other person said was an insult because these things get them to perceive uh, reality in the in the worst possible way. It's like they they put on, you know, dark sunglasses, and these people are already low on energy, and and depressed, and uh, you know, so they keep the voices to themselves. It's like a powder keg, and the voices grow stronger while they're in isolation because there's nobody to interfere or give this person support, and they try to drive off anybody who does try to help them and support them. And they do a pretty decent job on that. So this drags along. The voices kind of increase until they figure, well, I'm going to tell the last, uh, the last person in the world that I really trust about these things, and that's their parents. So they go and, and tell their parents, and the parents freak out. You know, oh my God, what what is this? You're hearing voices. What? You know, this isn't right. Uh, you know, they don't know what to do about it. Uh, you know, the the patient usually is causing a lot of turmoil in the family. There's a lot of screaming matches, uh, uh, trying to drive the parents away. Finally, they drag the uh, the person to a psychiatrist. All right. So the patient at that point usually perceives being dragged to the psychiatrist as a uh, stab in the back by their parents. Uh, because they don't want to go to any psychiatrist, and that's the last place of vo the voices want them to go. So they feel that that was a betrayal on the part of their parents, and the voices assure them it was. <laughs> you know, they go, well, yeah, you can't trust them either. So when they get to the psychiatrist's office, you know, now in straightforward, you know, uh, non technical terms, this is what they are told you know, uh, by the, uh, an esteemed member of the, the system. You, know, you have a mental illness. The, the voices you hear are hallucinations, even though they seem very real to the patient. They're being told they're hallucinations, they're not real. But to the patient, they're very real. You know? And uh, you know, psychiatrists basically tell them nobody else hears these things. You know, so you're the one who's mentally ill because the rest of us don't hear these things. So they tell them, well, you know, you have a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. This is what they're going to call you. And you're psychotic. And that means you're out of touch with reality as we see it. So here's the patient, like, goes into the psychiatrist's office and he's been hit with all this. And then comes, you know, 
what this means is you're insane, you're a lunatic, because basically they're telling him he is. There is no other explanation for your constant hallucinatory experiences. Something is broken in your brain. So they tell him that there is no cure, you know, that they have to take medications and, and you know, very powerful toxic medications for life, and there is no other treatment. Uh, and, and in their eyes, there isn't. Uh, so, you know, they, they go, well, the pharmaceutical industry has come up with some very effective medications that will suppress your voices. But they don't cure anything. I mean, they suppress the psychotic symptoms. So the patient's basically forced into taking these mind-numbing any psychotic drugs with, with these side effects. You know, their breasts begin to grow. There's massive weight gain. <clears throat> blood pressure goes all, all over the place. They have seizures. The blood sugar goes out of control. Uh, with long-term use, there's something called tardive dyskinesia that, that takes place. It's an involuntary jerking of their muscles in, the, in their face and their tongue that they can't control at all. Uh, and uh, it, it'll spread throughout their entire system where their hands are shaking, their body shaking, and if it goes far enough, it, it lapses into what they called at the state hospital, uh, the Thorazine shuffle. So, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has come up with something to counter that. And what's actually happening with these uh, symptoms is there it's a destruction of their peripheral nervous system. And if it goes on long enough, it's a permanent destruction. Uh, and their brain is being killed. They've recently have research showing that the brain cells die under the influence of these powerful drugs. And, uh, and the brain starts to shrivel. So what they go is, you know, never fear. We have something that'll take those side effects away. And they give them cogentin, which is, you know, kind of gives them a high and is, is somewhat addictive. Uh, but it mellows them out so they can't experience these uh, side effects too bad, these horrible side effects. So um, the, what, they, what the medications do is they calm the voices, and the voices don't like being calmed. Um, so uh, what the voices do, and I, I didn't, it took me seven years to, fit to, for, to come to this, is they will focus the patient's attention on the negative side effects of the antipsychotic drugs and tell them, and these side effects weren't good as you saw, and they'll tell them, the psychiatrist is poisoning you. you know, look at these side effects. You are being poisoned by your psychiatrist. You need to get off these drugs. And, uh, you know, they do. They go off those drugs in horrendous numbers. You know, so the drugs at the time I was at the, at the state hospital were the only thing to maintain their link to sanity. Uh, otherwise, they were just, they were out there. They were unreachable. And psychosis is, is the worst nightmare. I mean, it's, it's especially paranoid psychosis. It, 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 it's got to be akin to going through war, being on the front lines. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible experience. Uh, but time after time, they stop taking their drugs and they'd lapse back into this psychotic state as if they were doing it voluntarily. I found out uh, after seven years that it was the voices telling them not to take their medications because the medications were poison. And any psych staff knows that these people go off their medications constantly. And the reason they give is because of the side effects, the horrible side effects. So what I did is got, uh, I, I tested, decided, you know, why uh, choosing Psychosis over the side effects is akin to choosing whether to get the flu or to whether to get the bubonic plague. I mean, that's the choice. One's bad, the other's much worse. And these guys were constantly choosing the bubonic plague. And I'm like, why? That, that makes no sense. It's against all survival issues. Uh, they can't function when they're psychotic. Uh, they, it's, a, it's a nightmare. Why are they choosing the worst? And time after time, this went on for years, I would ask them, you know, and they would say, because of the side effects 
of these medications. Well, okay, what's worse? You know, and, and finally got to the point where I had them write down all the side effects of the medications that they experience because they don't experience all of them. And then two or three pages of psychotic, horrible psychotic symptoms. So I'd give them the first sheet and say, write down all the negative side effects you've experienced from your medications. All right, so they write down, you know, five or 10. And I give them those three sheets of psychotic symptoms. I said, which of these have you experienced when you went off your meds? And it was like a bunch of, of them circled. You know, and they were all horrible. And when they finished that, I would give them the two sheets and I would say, which is worst? Consistently, they'd go, well, yeah, the psychosis is worst. Then it'd be like, okay, so then why do you keep take, stopping your medications? And, and some of them would stop taking medications over and over again for, you know, eight, ten times. And, and they would say, I don't know. I don't know. And that went on for years. I don't know. I don't know. Until one day, seven years after I'd been in the state hospital, one patient admitted that the voices told her that she was being poisoned and to stop taking her meds. Now, along with this is the high assault rate upon psychiatrists at the state hospital. I mean, that was one. They had a higher assault rate three times that of any other medical staff anywhere. And, and this is pretty consistent around, around different institutions. Psychotics would assault them at a rate, even though they spent a small fraction of the amount of time with these patients that other medical staff did, they would be assaulted at a rate three times higher than any other doctor or, or professional staff, psychologists, psych nurses, anybody else, which was very interesting because uh, the voices didn't like their drugs and they were the ones that were prescribing them. So, uh, you know, after, by the time these guys got to me, they've been through these traumatic experiences and, and had been locked up a number of times for going off their meds. Um, and here I come along and go, hey, I'm the new psych on the unit. Tell me about your voices. <laughs> it's like, you know, you can tell what they're thinking. Whoa, you know, I'm not telling you about nothing, especially since I was charged with making sure that they stayed on their voices. And I was kind of like, or stayed on their medications. And, uh, I was kind of like the watchdog that if any of them went off their medications, I needed to note that and tell psychiatry. And they would be forced back on their meds again, or they would be discharged if they wouldn't go on them. So, you know, what, what I'm dealing with here is paranoid schizophrenics, and they are paranoid. And this is a huge barrier to reaching them. Um, and it took years to learn how to get past that, especially in the position I was in. Um, so, you know, after getting out of the state hospital, uh, where, where I realized that these things were, you know, I, I, I guess I was still resisting uh, accepting for myself that these things were something other than the, the person. You know, but I suspected it heavily, uh, and I couldn't probe too hard at the at the state hospital or any of the hospitals because when you start pushing to learn more about the voices, the voices get upset, and then the patient gets upset. So, the state hospital, one of the cardinal rules was you do not upset psychiatric patients, and doesn't matter what, you know, you don't accept, you don't uh, upset them because you never know what they're going to do. I mean, some of them can. And lapse into violence pretty quickly. So when psychiatry found out that I was asking them about the voices, I was reprimanded and ordered not to because they were hallucinations. I should know that. And that all I was doing was upsetting the patients and making them worse. So twice I was ordered to stop asking questions about the voices uh, because they noted the you know, the, some of those patients got upset and didn't want to answer questions about their voices and went and told the psychiatrist, oh, he's badgering me with questions. So I had to be real careful there. Um, 
when I went to work in the psych department of the state prison, a complaint like that wouldn't even break the the background noise. You know, any any complaint uh, by an inmate of a uh, psych asking him questions about its voices, <laughs> you know, that was small potatoes. That was you know that wasn't something to even consider. Um, so I was able to get a lot more information uh, from these people there and also probe deeper into the voices and how they operated. So to get to the point where I reached these cases where I'm telling you about took years. You know, it, it took years before they could talk to me and trust me. Uh, because like, again, even in the prison, I was a watchdog. So one of the first guys I, I uh, encountered was, you know, an inmate Sparger. He was, he was a timid guy and willing to talk about his voices and tell me in real time what they were saying. Now, this was very rare out of the whole population of, and, and what happened is they closed down all the uh, psychiatric hospitals all over the U.S., dumped these guys out on the, the street saying we're going to handle them in mental health clinics when they wouldn't even take their medications when they were being shoved down their throats under controlled conditions. They were expecting them to go to a mental health clinic and get any psychotic medications. It's a joke. They don't do it. They're not going to do it. So they go out and they do stuff like uh, what you're seeing you know, shoot people, the voices are telling them, yeah, you've got to kill all these people. And most, a lot of these guys that do this stuff are psychotic. And uh, society is reaping upon itself what it, uh, what it sowed. So, um, you know, Sparger was one of the first ones that uh, I started working with in the prison setting and was willing to tell me everything his voices were telling him in real time which, like I said, was very rare. When I found one of these guys, and I always had a small group of them available that I was working intensely with, uh, I, <laughs> that to me, they were like gold mines. They were like nuggets, uh, diamonds, because most of the patient in, uh, inmate population did not want to talk about the voices they were hearing uh, for obvious reasons, I mean, especially to a psych. So what, what was going on with him? He was a... Uh, uh, very highly paid stockbroker in New York on Wall Street, you know, making, you know, six digit, I mean, he's, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, he was married um, and was using a lot of cocaine. And eventually the voices jumped in there while he was using the cocaine and amphetamine. And uh, they, they got rooted in there. Now, what was, this guy was mild mannered. Um, he came to a group, so you know, for a, schizo, a paranoid schizophrenic to go to a group to try to get help was like a nonverbal, like, "Hey, you know, this guy wants some help," because they, you know, they get paranoid around all these other people looking at him. So started working with him, um, and he said after like 15 years, he had hid the voices from his wife for 15 years, and I'm like, "How the?" devil did you do that and uh, he said the voices were constantly telling him bad things about his wife which is this is what they do when the patient has a spouse or a girlfriend or any other re relative they start telling them bad things about them make them distrust them and try to break that relationship you know? um, so they were tell constantly telling him bad things about his wife running her down um, and uh, finally, after some 15 years of, uh, of you know, kind of keeping arm's length from her, uh, she, she filed a divorce. And when she saw that he seemed, as well as his voices, seemed very relieved that he was getting out of that relationship, and she noticed that, she took him to the cleaner. She took everything. She took everything he had. So he ended up uh, in New York City living out of garbage cans, you know, in, in some uh, grotto somewhere in Central Park. He, he slept on newspapers and uh, the voices liked that. And he did too. You know, he didn't mind it at all. I mean, even though he was freezing, he was in the rain. Um, uh, he said, I always knew which restaurant 
trash cans to go dig into. It was a very simple life. Uh, I was by myself. I didn't have to worry about anything. Um, you know, the voices were keeping me company. I could talk to them. Um, so, you know, it's like, I, I'm like, you know, why do you want to get rid of them? And he goes, well, you know, they, I know they're destroying my life. So we worked for months, you know, and what I was doing, basically, I mean, this is very simply, is telling him to do the opposite of everything the voices were telling him to do. And uh, kind of try to get him on a positive spiritual path. And as he started working with those things, the voices started losing energy until they kind of one day, while in my office, they just screamed and disappeared. You know? And I looked at him and he looked like he was about to fall out of the chair. And uh, he looked at me and he said that silence is deafening. So this is the first time in decades that the voices have been gone. And uh, I told him what he needed to do to keep them gone. Uh, and he did that for a few weeks. Now, he was working in the prison's uh, uh, answering service for a uh, motor vehicle. So he was able to, to function in that capacity. And before I was transferred off that unit, I stopped by and asked him, I said, how are you doing? And the voice is, uh, voice is still gone. He said, well, they were, they were gone for two months, but uh, uh, I got lonely, you know, and he didn't have any friends. Uh, so he called them back, you know, and they came back. And there he was, psychotic again. That's the way he wanted it. So here he was working on the phone lines, psychotic as a bed bug. So, well, that's one story. You got, you got any questions, James, or should I? Just keep yeah, trucking yeah that was kind of a sad you know outcome to that story because i guess he just wasn't used to the deafening silence and we hear this from some people where and maybe they don't understand the dynamic uh, of the intrusive thoughts but when they're left to their own devices when they're alone and they don't have someone to interact with i guess either a combination of the, the deafening silence and or these intrusive voices I can see how it could lead to self-medication where they want to blot out all that, you know, by drinking too much or, or imbibing and other, other drugs, um, substances, just, just to destroy thought. Um, you know, Jim Morrison of the doors talked about how one of the reasons why he was such a hardcore alcoholic was it destroys thought, right? It just blots everything out. So, you know, that's, that's the first thing I thought about when you told me the story about that poor guy. Well, you're, you're exactly right there. I mean, they will use virtually anything to try to self-medicate, except the medications they're supposed to take. So what the voices do is go, oh, yeah, yeah, these, you know, and, and most, you know, they have a hard time realizing that these things are not who they are because they sound just like their thoughts. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they do. It's very disconcerting. It's very fearful. And some of the things that these voices tell them are very vile and ugly. And, uh, you know, they don't want to tell anybody about what they're saying. So, yeah, they do turn to any kind of drug. And the voices want them to use specific drugs, amphetamine being the number yeah. one. You know, and they will tell. I mean, I've, I've talked to many inmates that told me that the voices told them where to go to get amphetamine when they run out and what time to be there mm. and they they showed up there and somebody with amphetamine came by and and gave it to them and it, wow. this was time after time after time after time now along with that the, the alcohol story there's one one uh one story i had down here in the timeline here um uh a very violent, psychotic, drunken Apache. All right, here it is here. Um, so they couldn't deal with him on the reservation. He was a big guy. And he was, he was violent, violent and, and a, a drunkard. And one day I got word that they were sending him to my unit and I would be in charge of providing psych services for him. 
So I tracked him as he was coming in on the computer, on the, on the prison system's computer. And this guy, usually inmates, before they get to our unit, they stop at Alhambra or one of the classification centers or, you know, they're, they're way laid in between and evaluated. This guy just crashed straight through the system and, and you could just see him, boom, Alhambra, boom, through, bang, bang, bang. And he's on his way to my unit. I'm like, holy cow, how did he do that? How did he break through all these other blockages that they usually have? But he was coming. And uh, uh, so when he got there, uh, I pulled him in. And, you know, uh, what I heard was he was kind of like a evil Indian medicine man or, or a very bad skinwalker. But he, he worked in those realms, and, and he was pretty spooked. by the, the other Indians were pretty spooked by him. So this was my chance to, I mean, the, the closest thing I would ever get to probably talking to a skinwalker or one of these kind of strange guys. So I called him into the psych department after he, he got there and said, okay, my name's Jerry. Uh, I'm going to be kind of watching over you uh, psychologically from the time you get here. I'll be calling you in at least once a month uh, just to check on you, see how you're doing with your meds and if you're having any problems and, and just kind of seeing how things are going for you here. Uh, see if we can't arrange you for, you know, for some uh, programs for you and do something about your drinking. And he looked at me like I'd rather, you know, slit your gut, spill your, your intestines all over the floor than say another word to you. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'll uh, see you next month. So I went to the head of the um, Native American uh, inmate group on the yard who was a, a very mellow uh, Navajo fella, an elderly fella, um, who I liked a lot. I, I helped the natives get uh, get wood for their their sweat lodges and their ceremonies and stuff like that. So uh, I always had a good relationship with those guys. And I asked this guy, "And what's with this Apache? You know, what's going on with him?" And he said, uh, "You be very careful of him." And I went, oh, "Okay." So. It took me probably three months before I could talk to that fella for 20 minutes with it, without him getting angsty and, and feeling like he, you know, he had to get out of there. And he started telling me about his battles with spirits um, and all the spells he could cast and these strange stories that kind of reminded me of some of the stuff Carlos Castaneda talked about. They were otherworldly stories where spirits were chasing him and he was battling spirits and he could see them and, and you know, it was like a strange world, but it did smack of the Carlos Castaneda stuff. Um, so finally one day I kind of took a risk and uh, was telling me one of these stories. I asked him, I said, well, if you can do all this stuff and you can fight these spirits, why couldn't you stay sober? And man, I was holding my breath like, is this guy going to go off on me? And I'm kind of watching him closely. And uh, he goes, I'll tell you why. Because of the spirits of dead alcoholics. And I'm like, you know, what, what do you mean? What spirit? He says, they can't get drunk unless they have a body to go into that's drinking. So they're constantly trying to break in there because they can't get high in the spiritual form. They have to be in somebody's body to get their high again. And he told me about a bar uh, in Phoenix where these alcoholic drunk spirits were piled up so high over that bar that they disappeared into the sky. And, um, you know, every time he walked by that bar, he said he had a fight on his hands because these things were trying to jump into him to get him to drink. Uh, his girlfriend was alcoholic, and he said he watched these spirits escort her into traffic in front of a truck, and she got hit and killed while she was drunk. And he said he could see the spirits that guided her in front of that truck. So what he maintained is uh, that the cravings that you feel uh, or alcoholics feel is not just a physiological thing. It's these things wanting more alcohol so you know you could you can go you know one drink is not enough and a million is not is you know one is too many and a million is not enough 
So they will get in there and they will just drink until the guy passes out. And the, the more he drinks, the more enter and the more control they have over him. So if, if what this guy is saying is the truth, it's it's not just the the patient or the victim drinking. It's also these these dark spirits who can't get drunk any other way than possess their bodies. So, you know, I would tell that story to uh, alcoholics who would come into the emergency room when I was working psych there and tell them, you know, okay, those thoughts for you to drink, if this story is true, those thoughts telling you to drink are not your thoughts. They're coming from these things. You know, and a lot of them went, well, you're right. You know, you're right. You know, there's, I don't want to drink. And, you know, these... I feel compelled to. So once they realize that there's an outside force, at least in part, and probably to a big part, driving their drinking, and that's why they call spirit spirits, I guess, is that now it's not them who's totally at fault. They have an opponent who is an enemy that is trying to get them to drink. And that makes a big difference in how much blame they attribute to themselves and how much guilt that produces, which maintains their drinking. So at least they have a fighting chance if they know there's an outside force that are putting those thoughts in their head, telling them to drink. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, let me see what else. Uh, Yeah, so that that you know that goes hand in hand with your you know your your drinking story. And with alcohol, the withdrawal effect for every ounce you drink, there's a 12-hour withdrawal, and it just keeps mounting. So if you drink a six-pack, it's 12 hours, you know, times six. You know, that's how many hours before your body body recovers, and it just keeps building, 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 building until you have a, you can go into alcoholic psychosis or DTs, which is basically, you know, you're, you're crazy, you're bouncing off the walls. Um, so any drinkers out there that are having a hard time with that stuff, you might want to think about that. Any comments, James, or any questions? Yeah, just a couple of quick comments, because I, I've seen the malign effects of alcohol on people that I was sure were hearing voices because they would argue with the, the, themselves. They would like snap and kind of like get angry as if like some kind of negative thought came into their head and they were trying to dispel it or banish it or in internally arguing with it or something. And a lot of times they would kind of, for lack of a better term, phase out where you know, they're with you one moment and then the next you look at them and they're just they're kind of spacing out, looking off into the distance or, or turned inwards and they're like in their own little headspace, their own little world. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see now that the, it's this internal thing going on, this internal dialogue with whatever these entities are. And also a point you made earlier, Jerry, about how these entities strive to isolate us. They strive to turn us against those who, you know, that are part of our support system by pushing all these negative thoughts in our heads to engender mistrust and suspicion upon other people. And I couldn't help thinking, Jerry, about all the people out there that I was sh pretty sure to begin with were entity infested, but these particular people were incorrigible gossips where they were constantly talking about other people. And I couldn't understand. It's like, why don't they talk about the weather? Why don't they say good things about other people? Why not just not talk about other people at all? And of course, you, you know, you find out down the track that they're talking about you, of course, because you're a person, right? They'll, they'll talk to me about these other people. And it's what they always say about gossips, where if they're always gossiping to you about other people, what are they saying behind your back? And I've, I've experienced that firsthand, Jerry. And, and now, from what you told me, it's these intrusive thoughts that are just constantly pecking away at them. James is this. Sally is that. Jerry is this. Jerry did this. Jerry's talking about you behind your back. And they can't help but verbalize these intrusive thoughts because, like you pointed out, 
key point, folks, these intrusive thoughts are in our own thought voice. They sound like our own thoughts. So our de, de facto default setting is we're the ones thinking up all these things. But now it, it becomes crystal clear these people, and in the old days, Jerry, they had a term in some traditional societies in, in Europe, the spirit of accusation, where there would be a certain person in a village or a town that all they did was make accusations against other people, uh, gossip about other people. And I think this is where it comes from, the spirit of accusation, Jerry. And, you know, the point you made about how the intrusive thoughts strive to drive people away from their support system. There you go. Well, I, you're absolutely right there. Now, the, the Christian mystic Emanuel Swedenborg, who wrote the book Heaven or Hell, he, he talked about these spirits some 700 years ago and how they operated. And the, the first psychologist that I know of who realized what he was talking about was a fellow named uh, Wilson Van Dusen, who wrote The Presence of Other Worlds, um, which was published by the Swedenborg Society. And he documented a number of cases where he was speaking to the voices of his patients. So unlike myself, who always knew that they were rotten things that needed to be destroyed, he would bring his patients in and, and say, well, no guarantees, but you know, I'd like to learn about your voices and, and hear what they have to say. And he would strike up conversations with the voices uh, to try to find out about them. Um, at one point he gave, uh, so I, I worked with him two years before his death. We were trying to get a book written when, when, when cancer took him over. But during that time, he told me some interesting tales. He, he said uh, on one patient, uh, he got both the patient and the voices to agree to take both a Rorschach and an MMPI, you know, which had both had psychotic scales on them. And he gave the, those tests to the patient independently of the voices and you know told the voices you you just answer what you think and the patient answer what you think and don't listen to the voices uh, the voices were more psychotic than the patient himself he said which I found interesting um, so you know, he carried on you know hundreds of conversations with the voices and found that they didn't know anything more than the patient carried in their own memory. He said there was one voice who insisted he was an engineer, but he didn't know any more mathematics than the patient herself. You know, so you know that was interesting. And and one thing Sherry found out about them, and you know I learned too, is is that they're consummate liars. They will tell you the patient any lie that will upset them. And when they get them really unbalanced, they will tell them they, they've done really bad things and insist that they did those things. And the patient's kind of wondering whether they actually did do those things, but they can't tell anybody or ask anybody if they did those things because then they think they were crazy. So it was like a, a, a big circle. It's like a form of internal gaslighting, Jerry. And when I think about and it may seem like we're kind of diverging, folks, but I think it's germane to the conversation because we all know what narcissistic behavior is like, narcissistic behavior. We all know what it's like to be gaslighted by somebody, some narcissist who is a pathological liar. You see them do something a moment ago right in front of you, and then when you point it out to them, they say, no, I didn't do that. When you know you saw them do something, right? That's just an example in which I've experienced personally. And the more I think about it, I would say that people like that, these voices, these intrusive thoughts and these, these malign entities have so comfortably merged with these people, Jerry, that it's just part of their being. They've become so integrated with these intrusive thoughts, with these negative entities that the entities work through them, speak through them, strive to manipulate narcissistically uh, confuse and confound others because that's what its shtick is, right? It's like they try to put their distorted reality upon us, put their crazy interpretation of reality upon us, and then make it look like we're the whack jobs. 
And, <laughs> and I see that all the time because in this particular field we're in, Jerry, there's so many fantasy prone individuals. There's so many narcissists. There's so many people with, uh, you know, grandiose personalities constantly big noting themselves. And now it just, what you're telling me just reinforces my previously held belief that these are just entity infested people that they just can't help verbalize all these things that keep, you know, streaming into their minds. Yeah. One thing, uh, <clears throat> one thing I saw that was interesting while working in the prison is, you know, they would catch an inmate doing something red handed. I mean, they had him, they had him and he would just continue to make up a lie and maintain that lie and stuck by that lie until the, the officers believed it and he got away. I've seen that happen over and over and over again. It, now, it's almost like they expect like people just to throw in the towel. Okay, you win. <laughs> it's, well, you believe not, it, not, you know? It, it's either, you know, okay, we don't have enough to, or, or we sort of believe it, or this could have been the case. You know, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt when they shouldn't have over and over again. But what, what Swedenborg said some 700 years ago, he said that all thoughts, none of our thoughts belong to us. You know? And that you know, one thing that I've seen and Sherry has seen and has developed a program to, to combat was that any negative thought about yourself that comes into your mind is put there by them. And it's a lie. So one of the th one of the things she did to she Sherry's my com uh, she's my uh, what do you call it buddy in arms here. I mean I I've met her uh, 15 years ago. I I know that she was uh, you know, one of the most brilliant people I knew, uh, and I met her while we were. She had a, the biggest prison reform website in the uh, in the country, and I was advising her on how to make the Alabama prison system sweat because I couldn't do it to my own prison system without getting fired. Uh, and, and she did a pretty good job of that. But after that, through the years, we've kind of always kept touch. And, you know, one day I had an interesting uh, case, uh, a psychotic inmate, and I started telling her about that. And she goes, oh, I know all about these things. I know all about the voices. You know, I said, well, how, how do you know that? And she said, well, I, I had to deal with them myself when I was a young woman, and then I had to fight them for years before I figured out a way to get rid of them. And, and I'd known her for like 15 years before she said this. She was an accomplished engineer. You know, she was, she, her memory is twice as sharp as mine is. She's very well organized. She was dealing with multi-million dollar, you know, construction projects. Uh, and she's one of the most spiritually advanced people I knew. And here she is telling me that as a young woman, she, she was hearing voices and that she found her own way to get rid of them. So we started comparing notes. And first of all, I, I didn't quite believe her. So I started asking her, uh, you know, hammering her with questions that nobody would know the answers to unless they had actually dealt with these voices. And she just bam, 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 right down the line. She knew all those things. So I'm like, holy cow. So from that point on, we just, you know, uh, when I ran into an interesting case that puzzled me, I'd call her up and go, hey, I'm seeing this. What the devil's going on? And uh, she would either not know or she'd give me information from her perspective. So it was kind of like we just kind of linked up and been working together ever since then. But one of the programs she found, and I tested on the front lines, that works, I mean, it, it it's not enough in and of itself most of the time, but it's a pretty powerful tool, is if the patient can get to the point where they can recognize who they are from the voices and the lies the voices are telling them, they can apply this program, which is basically, like I told you, any negative thought that comes into your head is put there by these entities and they try to get it to fester. So she would cut that off right away and automatically say, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. So if you counter that enough times, the amount of upset that they can trigger because you're not buying into their lies starts to greatly diminish. And so it's a very powerful tool that, 
that I've put to use uh, in the prison that, you know, I kind of, I kind of knew basically how it worked, but boy, she really, you know, she really compacted it and put it into a very concise form that it's very usable. Um, so it's not like schizophrenics are the only ones that hear these things. We all do, all of us, you know, again, every negative thought that comes into your mind is put there by them. The more they can upset you, what they're after is the generation of negative emotional energy, which is what they feed off of. Now, for years, I suspected, I saw an energy drop in the schizophrenics who I worked with who were telling me consistently, different ones and different units, even, even in different states. You know, after the voices hit them, their energy level dropped to zero to virtually zero they couldn't even get out of bed they couldn't function they were so drained of energy that it was they told me it was like working out in the hot sun all day with a pickaxe digging digging uh, pits and and they were just completely drained and there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between the appearance of the voices and their energy disappearing now for years i thought that was because of the massive amount of anxiety that these things generate because they tell them all kinds of god awful things you know and and here's these things you know they're they're telling you you're worthless you're no good kill yourself uh, uh i mean anything that they can to generate that negative emotional energy and then it pff, they take it uh but i uh, i attributed that for years to the very high anxiety state that these things generate when they're attacking and sometimes it's not just one or two of them, it's a whole herd of them. You know, like some people have hundreds of them in their heads. And when all those attack at once, it's like, you know, unbearable, unbearable. It's like a flash mob in intrusive it, thought terms where they, it's all yeah, it, up on you uh, at one moment. Very, a very violent one, you know, a very verbally violent one. So for years, I thought, it was the anxiety that, that those attacks caused and what these, these voices were saying. One day, uh, when I was assigned to the jail for the prison, central detention unit, so the, all that changed. You know, that, that the anxiety hypothesis went, just blew apart. Uh, <clears throat> at about the same time, I got a, an inmate letter from the roommate of a psychotic. Uh, uh, who a roommate who whose room his roommate was psychotic was paranoid schizophrenic and this guy who wrote the letter asking me for help uh, had snitched off the gangsters in the prison and they were trying to kill him they'd already stabbed him once uh, he was in the CDU for protective custody they wanted him dead so bad because they lost so much on on you know the the guards took all their all their drugs and and sent all all these gangsters to higher custody units and they were like a bunch of uh, Africanized bees, man. They wanted this guy dead. They wanted him dead so bad. They sent some of their members. They purposely got in trouble so they could be sent to the CDU, so they would have an an opportunity to kill this guy. And they had already stabbed him once, and. I don't know how they do this, but they have they have these strings that, that they've put a message on the end of, and they can throw it under their door that it goes all the way across the floor and under the door of a cell 40 feet away, 30 feet away. And, and then when they yank it, it leaves that message in the door. And then you, you just see that string just disappear back across the floor again. And it's, I saw it once. It's like, holy cow, how the devil do they do that? So they were sending this, this guy who snitched him off all these messages. You know, your time is limited. You know, we're, we're right here. I'm in cell. You know, da, da, we're, uh, we're going to get you. It's only a matter of time. You, you couldn't be under much more stress than this guy. He's got a psychotic roommate. He wakes up three in the morning and here's a psychotic guy standing over him, staring at him in the dark, just standing there staring at him. And he looks up at the, this crazy guy and he's like, whoa, you know. So I get, a, I get an inmate letter from him saying, hey, you know, you got to get me out of here. And 
at the same time, I get a letter from the captain of the jail, the CDU, saying, you know, we got this psychotic guy over here who's causing some problems with his roommate. You need to do something about this. And they were both in the same cell. So you couldn't have a better experimental situation. Everything was equal. You know, their environment was equal. The, the, the things they did were equal. Their schedule was equal. Everything was equal because they were, they were in the same cell. Well, they Jerry, the hold, hold that thought because we've reached the end of the first segment, and I think it's a good time to you know, take a break and, and segue into that in, in the second segment because, uh, folks, we're just getting started, and, and, and Jerry is, is sharing a lot of personal anecdotes and things that he has confirmed, verified to his own satisfaction, having been immersed in this kind of environment where it's like a living laboratory, literally, with all these people that are uh, paranoid, schizophrenic, and in this context – in the extremely hostile environment of the prison uh, correctional system. So uh, Jerry's website, uh, Jerry, do you want to tell the, the website that you and Sherry uh, share together? Yeah, we've had Sherry on the show. We'll have her back again, by the way, folks. Yeah, Sherry has a website where one section is dedicated to this kind of stuff. It's uh, a keyholejourney.com under the paranormal section. Uh, there are letters that are written by people who've um, experience these things. Uh, there's papers I've written. There's uh, videos, a whole section of videos on, on this stuff. Um, and then <clears throat> I've got a Facebook page. It's uh, called The uh, Presence of uh, Other Worlds and Schizophrenia, I believe I called it, um, or, or Paranoid Schizophrenia. Um, I've got a YouTube page, but um, I'm, I'm struggling to try to figure out how to work that thing, and it's not in good shape. But Sherry's got all the videos on her website. Uh, under the paranormal section, there's videos, there's papers. Um, and then again, that's uh, keyholejourney.com under the paranormal section. And we'll have all that information on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, for our dear listeners out there, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com sign up and become a member and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.